What's the study about and what does it mean for the Zika community? The study is a phase one study evaluating the use of a Zika a DNA Zika vaccine in uh, healthy volunteers. And the study demonstrated that we were able to generate an immune response against the Zika virus. We generated both antibodies and T cell responses against the virus. And what we did is we transferred the serum from participants, the antibodies from participants into a mouse model, into mice. And those mice were protected from Zika infection, suggesting that the vaccine is not only immunogenic, but might be effective because it prevented infection uh, after a passive transfer in this uh, animal model. For the Zika community, it means that we might potentially have a vaccine that may be effective preventing the devastating infection in humans. And the next step is to test this vaccine in a phase three trial, in a large trial, evaluating in, in, in the de developing world in an area endemic for Zika, if the vaccine will prevent clinical infection from with the Zika virus. Your veins, uh, because you've had blockages, are a little bit kind of inflamed. Each year, 300,000 Americans develop a blood clot of the leg. About half of these patients will develop a chronic complication called post-thrombotic syndrome despite the use of blood thinning drugs. Take a breath in. Post-thrombotic syndrome typically causes daily leg pain and swelling and can progress to cause major disability in a significant number of patients. The ATTRACT trial was performed to evaluate an innovative new clot-busting treatment that may be able to reduce this disability. The way this treatment is performed is that an interventional radiologist places a catheter-based device inside the vein and delivers a clot-busting drug directly into the clot under imaging guidance and using a tiny incision. The study found that the clot-busting procedure did not prevent the post-thrombotic syndrome, but that it did reduce the severity of the disease and reduced pain and swelling in patients with the largest blood clots. The importance of this study is that it will enable most patients with blood clots to avoid an unnecessary medical procedure while still enabling the patients with the largest blood clots who may benefit from the procedure to be treated. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the most common cancer diagnosis in children. But when standard treatment fails, options are limited. A recent approach has the potential to change this. Development of CAR T cells, in which a patient's immune cells are modified to see a protein called CD19 on leukemia cells, a treatment that was FDA approved in 2017. Although some patients remain in remission after CD19 CAR T, many will relapse. In this study conducted at the National Cancer Institute, we targeted CD22 and demonstrated for the first time that CAR strategies targeting alternate antigens in ALL could be equally potent. Now that we knew that both CD19 targeting and CD22 targeting could work on their own, what this meant for us is that we could now take it to the next step and use a double targeting approach. And that's what we're currently doing. And we hope that we can prevent the tumor from getting ahead of us with this approach. All right, so osteoarthritis is the commonest form of uh, arthritis and it's especially bad when it affects the knee joints. And despite the fact that it's very common um, and expensive, uh, there is no uh, treatment known to make a difference to its uh, rate of progression. We now know that there's inflammation in osteoarthritic knee joints, and so this study was done to test the hypothesis that by suppressing that inflammation by giving intraarticular corticosteroid injections every three months, uh, we might slow down the rate of structural progression. We enrolled 140 people to uh, receive either the um, steroid intervention uh, or an identical placebo. And we evaluated them every three months for pain and uh, measures of physical function. And we got MRI scans at baseline 12 and 24 months to measure the extent of damage in the joint. What we found overall was that there was no benefit um, for receiving uh, from receiving the corticosteroid injection in regards to pain or physical function and in fact that the group who got the corticosteroid injections exhibited uh, more cartilage loss. While this didn't translate to any difference between groups in pain outcomes within the two-year 
duration of the study, it's of course um, of concern uh, for the longer term if you're losing more cartilage. So overall, um, this study does not support the use of repeated corticosteroid injections for treating osteoarthritis of the knee joint. Cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy is a devastating genetic disorder that affects boys between the ages of 4 and 10. These boys suffer from a progressive demining disorder of the brain that usually first manifests as contrast enhancement evident on brain MRI. The boys subsequently decline rapidly and within a two-year period they are either vegetative or dead. Currently, the only treatment we have available is allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. However, it comes with complications of graft-versus-host disease and engraftment problems. We tried a new approach using ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy. Instead of taking cells from a donor, we took cells from the bone marrow of the boys themselves, transfected them in a dish with a lentiviral vector, carrying a normal copy of the faulty gene, and then returned those cells back to the boys. We followed them over a two-year period, looking for any changes in neurological function over time. What we found was that the procedure was well tolerated, and in 15 of the 17 boys, neurological function stabilized, and importantly, the contrast enhancement seen on first MRI diminished over time. We think that this is a first successful gene therapy treatment for a progressive disorder of the brain, and it is an important alternative, particularly for those boys lacking a matched sibling donor. Strokes are bad. Treating strokes can be hard. Preventing strokes is easier than treating strokes. But we have to recognize that not all strokes are from the same mechanism. We were interested in studying a specific stroke mechanism that typically happens in younger people, um, which is related to a hole in the heart known as a PFO. Generally, the treatment for preventing a stroke with PFO was using uh, non-specific therapy like blood thinning medicines and risk factor modification. But there is a PFO specific therapy of implanting a small device through a relatively low risk cardiological procedure to close the hole. That is putting a catheter up into the heart, placing the device and it holds the hole shut. That should prevent recurrence from PFO related stroke. We randomized about a thousand patients into uh, some who were treated with the device and some who were treated with medical therapy. And we found that the benefit for stroke prevention, and in particular for preventing the kind of stroke related to a PFO, was greater in the device group than in the group treated just with medical therapy alone. This led to the FDA approval of the first device indicated for stroke prevention in patients with stroke and PFO. My job as a heart surgeon is to take diseased hearts and reconstruct them. In this study, we compared mechanical and biologic valve prostheses. We looked at an 18-year period in the state of California and then looked at the outcomes of those patients over that period of time. So what we found is that the results in the aortic position and the mitral position were quite different. In the aortic position, the benefit of a mechanical valve began to disappear sometime in your 50s, but in the mitral position, the benefit of a mechanical valve persisted well into your 60s. To give you an example, a 60-year-old male comes into the office with mitral stenosis. And prior to this study, we might have suggested to the patient that he would have a choice between a mechanical heart valve and a biologic heart valve. After this study, we might suggest that he have a mechanical heart valve. And this study provides much more information to help the patients make the decisions that will increase the likelihood that they live a long, happy life.
At Nationwide Children's Hospital, we recently completed a clinical trial in spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA type 1. This is a disease that is devastating for infants, and they lose their life by the end of year two. The disease is caused by the loss of the survival motor neuron gene. In 15 SMA infants, we treated, in every single case, the children were rescued by putting the survival motor neuron gene in a virus called AAV. They were able to sit, they were able to feed themselves, and they were able to talk. If we treated them young enough, at young enough age, they were able to walk, run, and uh, play with other children. Something like that has never been achieved before. A major goal of biomedicine is to understand the function of every gene in the human genome. Naturally occurring loss of functional mutations can provide a mechanism to study the long-term effects of a genetic deficiency in humans. Our aim was to identify humans in which both copies of a given gene are inactivated due to such loss of functional mutations. Such human knockouts are extremely rare, so we particularly leveraged high levels of consanguinity in Pakistan and conducted whole exome sequencing studies in 10,500 Pakistanis. We found out that every fifth Pakistani in this resource was a human knockout. Overall, 1,317 unique genes were found to be knocked out in at least one participant. We are therefore expanding our sequencing studies to more than 100,000 Pakistanis enrolled in the Pakistan genomic resource that my group has established. We anticipate that we'll found knockout for many more genes. Through this human knockout project, we hope to understand the function of majority of human genes in the human genome. In a subset of HIV-infected people, as during their infection, they produce these antibodies that have activity against many different strains of HIV. So at very small doses of the antibodies, you could block many different strains of virus. And it is essentially a new class of HIV medications. So you could potentially have a prevention tool that you could administer you know, under, just under the skin, a small volume uh, every six months, and you could prevent HIV. Or you could give a uh, higher dose intravenously uh, these infusions every six months to maybe a year, depending on, on how this all evolves, and then treat HIV in, in that way. So when we are thinking now about strategies that can cure HIV, that can eliminate the, the very last infected cell, we are thinking about different kinds of drugs that interact with the virus in a way that is different from the current HIV medications. And these antibodies are, they have the potential to be one uh, such drug.